Hi, I'm Josh Bassiches, Director and CEO of the Royal Ontario Museum. Welcome to this special online presentation of our signature lecture series, Rom Speaks. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation since time immemorial to today. From fascinating viewpoints to thought-provoking insights, Rom Speaks presents the brightest minds and most compelling voices on ideas that matter across art, culture, and nature. Please enjoy this essential new addition to our Rom at Home digital programming. And I look forward to welcoming you back to the museum for more programs like this when it is safe to do so. It's such a pleasure to be able to talk to you and, and to get your perspective on not only the exhibition, but some of the activities that are going on in Jodhpur itself today that you've been a part of. But perhaps what we can start out right now is that the exhibition, you know, really tries to emphasize the place of Jodhpur. It is a site. It, is, it has its own history. It's connected to the land. So I, I'd like to know, in your view, what makes this region of Marwar Jodhpur in terms of its physical geography, for example, or even its place in Indian history? So I think, um, I think everyone saw a picture of Merangar Fort. So you saw it situated on a hill, the only hill in the region. So it's actually a really dry, arid, desert, rough terrain. It, it's called in Hindi, Marupumi, which is the land of death. So you could imagine, um, in 1459, when Rao Jodha was riding with, with a troop of um, 200 of his horsemen, and he decided to lay down, down oh, his capital on that hill. So I don't know what was going through his mind, but the region is, had nothing. So the work was that much more. You had to then provide for your people water. Now, I don't know how many people know this, but Marwar, not Rajasthan, but Marwar itself has no groundwater. It's completely rainwater dependent. So, apart from building a fortress to keep people, he had to it had to create um, water harvesting systems and really collect water. Otherwise, there was no way they could inhabit that area. So that is in in the centuries to come. After that, it became continual that uh, water bodies were created for people to live around, and that's where a lot of the women were involved as well in building. People. So the tough terrain is actually what makes it really unique. And in many ways, it's, it's, it's in some ways a contradiction and irony that it did flourish despite this, this hardship of land and landscape. And so in terms of the role it might have played in Indian history, can you comment a little bit about that despite this? Despite the, the hardship. But I think a lot, if you see how fortresses, the fortresses were built in those times, they would build them around the geography of the area. So I think. It, it, it almost didn't become a deterrent. They just used the geography, created this fort, and actually created a kingdom around it, in spite of the harshness of the terrain. But they found, and that's why the arts developed, because they wanted to bring the beauty in, the creativity. And I think we, they just worked through centuries harder to create something like that, and to create, a, we create the arts in the king, kingdom of Marwar. One of the other uh, themes in the exhibition that I, that I mentioned was the sense of this long continuity mm -hmm. and that the collection that's on display has remained intact because of the long continuous line that stretches back 39 generations. So I'd like to ask you, you know, what does it mean to you to be part of such a lineage um, and history? It seems like maybe a lot of pressure, but also <laughs> um, no, no, it is. It's quite actually, an opportunity. It's quite, it's quite daunting in one sense, but then in the other, it's something you take for granted. You look up at your fort, our fort, our fort of Jodhpur, and, um, and then the history is ours. So all the rulers are our ancestors, and in India you deify your ancestors. So it's a real sense of pride, and the fact that the collection has been added by people that we have written histories on is actually quite exciting. So. I mean, you do re you relate to it. I can't relate to it on an everyday basis. But I, I would think how my ancestors, the women, would live on the fort, what they would be doing, what they'd be creating. But then on the other spectrum, you completely distance yourself, and you see this fort, and 
how it existed in spite of all the hardships in those in those years. Well, and by extension, in many ways, you know, the objects in the exhibition, like you probably have a very different relationship to them than than we might, you know, being able to just to see them. And I was quite struck as we were walking through the exhibition the first time you and your father came to visit us. Um, and you know, as we were walking through through there, um, His Highness was looking at one of the portraits quite closely, and you said, "Oh, he resembles you," you know, or you resemble the portrait. And it struck me that. These are family photos for you, uh, or family portraits, you know. Right. So no, right. yeah, they are family portraits in that sense. But actually, I hadn't seen it like that. But it came quite naturally because he did. Well, no, well, it is one of our ancestors, and he does. My father looks like him. But um, but I think the paintings are the most special for me because they are. It's a pictorial history of of the fort itself. So there's uh, there's images which you'll see when when everyone goes around. They are of Maharajas uh, depicting, uh, I mean, lots of scenes of festivals, polo, or uh, elephant fights, and we can we can identify in within the fort and within another fort where all these activities took place. And I think that's really exciting because you open it and it's a ref we have a reference point in pictures within the fort. So that ground that quite grounds some of the some paintings. Of, some of the paintings. Yeah. So abstract. And in fact, we have festivals today in some of those same areas. So we have musicians sitting in some of the same areas where, where which are shown in the paintings, where the Maharaja was enjoying a, a musical evening and we recreate a musical evening. So I think that's quite exciting. So sticking with this theme of continuity, um, your family, the Jodhpur Royal family, has been through its share of transitions in history. You know, and each of these has had its ups and downs. One could argue that perhaps there was no more challenging a transition than in the mid 20th century, when India achieved independence from British colonialism. Uh, the rulers of India's independent kingdoms supported the formation of the nation, but also at the loss of their hereditary territories. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your own father has helped shape Jodhpur through this difficult transition, and later in the 1970s, with the loss of the Privy Purse, uh, he returned from studying abroad and in many ways reinvented you know, what it meant to be uh, a king. So in your view, what were some of the challenges that he faced and how did he overcome them? So in, during independence, that was a choice of all the kingdoms and all the principalities. They decided to join independent India. So that wasn't so much of a blow as a choice and there was a change in lifestyle. Of course, I wasn't around then. My father was only four years old when this happened, but um, I think they got on with it and they, his, my grandmother made the decision to educate him and, uh, and take it forward. He was still a king in, in the people's minds and especially in my grandmother's mind. He was a king, he had to be educated to rule his people, but in a modern context. So that was one part, so she sent him to England for his education and um, I think he spent most of his time in Eton and Oxford and he came back in the 70s. And that's when the real, the real hardships began, because the pretty purses were removed then, and um, he had this large kingdom, but no finances to, to run it. But he knew he was He was not going to sell anything, and his responsibility was to um, to get this kingdom alive again in a in a different context and make it more accessible to people, not just his family but all of Jodhpur, and he wanted people from the world to visit as well. So I think one of the first, one of the first things he did was he gave the fort to the trust and created the Menangu Museum Trust. So it was an open trust, the public could, the public could visit, the people of Jodhpur could visit. And um, on the financial side, then there was this big palace that he lived in with his, his mother, and then my mother. We went, still went around then, and um, he had to he had to run it had to run itself it had to pay for itself so that's when he started um, started as a hotel but m what's more important is he he was a pioneer in creating uh, the push towards heritage tourism so that not only helped him but all of Rajasthan where people not just palaces people had homes and babies everyone was facing the same trouble they had to run these white elephants with they didn't want to sell them, they wanted to keep them, 
but how do you get you get how do you get that economically stable and financial help with it? So this heritage tourism drive was actually one of what he started, which is really why Rajasthan is on the tourism map even till today. So that's one of the, the activities. And and I find that perhaps of of all of the former <coughs> kingdoms, Jodhpur seems to have been the most organized amongst the earliest to make some of these activities and have really created a package of activities around heritage tour mm -hmm. tourism, but also a lot of, of charitable uh, activities. So can you describe some of those, so, some of that work? So some of the, so heritage tourism was one of the activities. And then, I mean, because it was a great drive, many people, I mean, many people took to it. It helped everyone, it helped the economy of Jodhpur. And so that grew organically on its own. But one of the other great, uh, important charities started from my father was, um, as I said, there's no, there's no rainwater. I mean, there's only rainwater, there's no groundwater in Marwar. So the Jal Bhagati Foundation. So this is another charity that works with, with local with villages and the local knowledge. And um, the barefoot engineers. So they give a part of, they give their, um, their knowledge and the foundation helps them to create water bodies that were, would be traditionally, would have been there in the villages. So the traditional knowledge was used by the village, which, which was used by the villages, was in, it was encouraged and helped by this organization. And it's thrived. So today, even in some of the remotest villages, there's no uh, pipelines from the government. It's still rainwater. And all those traditional systems have been revived. And so this is a very successful, one of the successful projects. Um, I'll, I'll maybe mention, we haven't talked about this, but you know, one of the um, heritage kind of activities that uh, I kept hearing about and, and always would just miss about going to Jodhpur was the Sufi festival as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? So we actually have two festivals, two music festivals. One is Sufi. The reason why we chose Sufi is because we're, there's another fort that was restored. Uh, by the Getty Grant, which is now going it's two hours away uh, from Jodhpur. And that is in a very important Sufi site. Which, that's why we started the Sufi Music Festival. We changed it over the years and called it Sacred Music because you can encompass more music. But, and, and then we have the Rajasthan International Folk Festival. So there's two music festivals. But the and relevance, when do they happen? Uh, one is in October and one is in February. Okay. That's a fun time to visit so if anyone wants to come. But it's fun because this is what's really exciting about these festivals is it's, it's, it's in these spaces, Miranagar and Nagor. Throughout the year, there's, um, there's conservation works that go on. And I think a lot of people, it's not exciting for everyone to just come and see a fort that's conserved and a museum. So these music festivals really bring the place to life. And not only bring it to life, it's also encouraging the local musicians and our traditional musical heritage. And, they, and the local musicians will then perform with international musicians. So they, I mean, it, they enjoy it, and people enjoy it, and the forts and palaces are lived in, but pretty much like if you see the miniature paintings, they come, they come to life like they're supposed to. And in some ways one can and see these um, hosting of music festivals as a continued patronage of the other local artists. Oh, so, yes, I think so, because this is, this and, and, and one step, forward because it's patronage, they get to perform at these venues, but they get to meet international artists and that's what's really exciting for the musicians, the local musicians. So then uh, perhaps turning to um, one of the themes in the uh, exhibition that I spoke about, which is really about the royal women mm -hmm. and their role at court. Um, you know, you are part of a long lineage of royal women who've played important roles at court, while not always preserved in written histories their roles are being more recognized now. Mm -hmm. But you have a first-hand view of recent history. So can you speak a little bit about this? You know, what did you observe about your grandmother and about your mother, um, both of which I think have been so involved in I different think before, before I go, there is one thing I'd like to say yeah. about the Zanana, because a lot of people, well, I've heard while I've been here, when, who, who, the, they're a bit skeptical about the Zanana being the women's role in the Zanana. So I just want to make clear that it's, um, there was another sphere for women. It was not equal to men. But what we're trying to show in this exhibition is that, is their influence. It's not, 
it, they weren't just passive, they weren't just sitting on the side, influencing the way of their diplomacy, the patronage to the arts. So I think that's, I just want to make that very clear. And then in our history, we see it because they were patrons of the art. They came with their own finances and what did they use those for to build water bodies? Again, really essential for Jodhpur and the region of Marwar. And um, the festivals they ran, they watched, they watched the proceedings of the courts. They, in fact, there's a very interesting painting in the exhibition of the women's court being held, which is very similar to the men's court, the Darbar. So that's quite interesting. And, and then this carried on over the centuries, till very recently. And I've seen my, my grandmother, who is an example, who grew up as a reigning queen and uh, lived in the Zanana, behind the veil. And after independence, she was forced to come out because, well, it was, again, it was a choice. But when I say forced, it just means that she, she was never trained to come out and speak in public. She, was never, she never thought she'd have to do it. But after independence, if she wanted to help her people, because my grandfather passed away by then, by then, her son was really young, she joined <coughs> politics. And she came out in public, removed her veil, encouraged other women to remove the veil, and, um, and then actually joined the political, joined politics, joined the parliament, and just moved on from there. And I think, I think that's incredibly great. Amazing. It's really, I mean, and so that, my strength today comes from some stories like this. Because this wasn't part of her life, of her life but I mean, that's what she did, and giving back was always part of what she wanted to do, and which she did. And I've seen my mother work every day. Of, I mean, I've seen them work in the museums, in the hotels, work for Jodhpur, women's education in the water harvesting projects. So this is what the women in my family do, and it inspires me. That's uh, great stories. Um, so, um, getting back to this idea of some of the heritage activities uh, that Jodhpur, I think, has really been a leading force in, uh, in India. Um, you yourself play a major role in some of these endeavors. So, can you speak to some of the aspects you personally are involved in? Um, so, one is, what is the hotels? I think about heritage tourism. I, um, so, I manage all our, all our properties. Which, which I really enjoy. There's the management side of it, and then there's the, what I enjoy keeping it a, a sustainable business with the food, local foods, use local materials, local artisans, which I use as much local as possible. So I enjoy doing that a lot. Music, the music festivals is something we've spoken about, but I enjoy that because you use, again, the, you use these spaces in a, to get younger people involved in a more modern context, something different, so I enjoy that a lot. And uh, the, the latest project that I'm working on, which I find really exciting, is the skill development for the local arts, uh, for the local craftsmen in our area. So we have this big handicrafts industry, and I find that uh, the middlemen make all the money, and it doesn't go directly back to the craftsmen. And the high quality of workmanship that you will see in the exhibition has gone down over the centuries. But, but, the, but the same families are still around, which is very interesting. So, but, so this project is now a skills development project. So we have to work with them and actually get, bring their skills to a level. Oh, sorry, bring the skills to a level. A level um, that which, like the paintings and like the exhibits, so that's what we're working on. And I'm very excited about this project. And, and so what are some of the outcomes of, of, of that? So we've just, we, we've had our first, just, we've actually just started it. We're setting up a um, we're setting up a workshop for women in Nagore, in one of the forts. So they will have we'll have skill, women's employment and uh, the skills development. I just work for the future. So now we're going to get designers in. So we have the spaces to sell. We have the largest footfall in Jodhpur. In fact, the footfall for Jodhpur is calculated by the visitors of the fort to the fort. So if we can get them to produce these really high-end quality products, it goes directly back to these artisans. So it's the it's leather industry, it's jewelry, it's um, dali makers, but all of them, but really put in the design. Fantastic. So um, just talking a little bit more about yourself, um, 
people may not know that you actually studied social anthropology mm -hmm. at Cambridge. And then you went on and studied film, actually, at the New School in New York City. So what did you love most about these experiences? And what might be ways that you are applying them right now to the work you're doing back mm -hmm. in Jodhpur? Um, I think what I loved most, I enjoyed my experience both in England and love New York City. But, um, and at that, what I've learned from both these experiences is to look at my own culture from the outside, which was very interesting to me. And anthropology actually teaches you that. So I learned to respect it because being within it, being a Rajput is a little, um, it, it again, like you said, our histories can be daunting, the whole experience can be a little bit daunting. But once you look at it from the outside, you you understand it. You understand you understand that a Rajput, or I understood that a, a Rajput is his history. And that's very important. So then, then you understand the importance of um, I suppose marriages and alliances, even in today's context, even though I might not want to take that forward myself, but you really understand where it comes from, and anthropology taught me that. So one is the understanding, but the second I apply it every day to the musicians, to the arts and crafts, everything we do, relationships, um, buying local, employing local people, what people want in the area, what the different communities want, I apply it every day in my work. So I, I think it's a great degree. It was really good to do. So we will be also expecting lots of films from you. No, I, made <laughs> my, I made my film and then gave up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe you'll go back to it. <laughs> so, okay. so um, you know, Jodhpur, it seems to me, especially in the last few years, is getting increased attention, you know, as the preferred destination for things like celebrity weddings, you know, and I will briefly mention, you know, Priyanka Chopra and Nick Jonas uh, recently getting married in Jodhpur at uh, Mehinger Fort and Ume the Bhavan, right? Um, so, you know, considering the ways that the world is changing, you know, through politics, economics, through digital connectivity, how do you see the cultural landscape of Jodhpur changing in the future? So, I really don't mind anyone getting married in Jodhpur. It, it attracts the attention. <laughs> Please come and get married, we're happy. <laughs> but on a more serious note, I mean, that's not, the, that's not what Jodhpur is. We're happy to attract the world, but a lot, what, wedding tourism, what it does is, they come in, they come into the palace, they stay there, and then, and then you leave. You don't really add anything back to, um, the city. So the idea is to actually encourage tourism, encourage people to keep returning. And if you want people to return, you have to create, you have to show them more of the city. So the city, I think right now, Jodhpur is growing quite rapidly, quite interestingly within the whole city. So people are becoming very um, aware of the heritage and the culture. So even if you have a trendy cafe, it will be in a really well restored building. And people are doing this across the board in Jodhpur. So I think even with the change and what's happening in the other bigger cities, I think Jodhpur is a city, the younger people are becoming more responsible and they're excited by their own city. So I think we have a, it's a very positive way we're moving to the future. And so it sounds like there's maybe a changing wave from young people usually leaving the smaller city to go into the mm -hmm. larger cities. So perhaps yeah, that's changing. That, I think that is changing because they're enjoying their city and they, they I mean, uh, in the West you call it gentrifying it or, or what are they, the young trendies or the, but, I mean, but that, but Jodhpur is becoming that and they don't want to leave. It is that hub for the younger people. And uh, so I think it, it's a good move because it's, it is a beautiful city. You understand your heritage. You have the world visiting. And, and the pride in the city is still there. And the only thing I find a little bit scary is, the, is sometimes the politics, because the city is built for inclusion, the old city, which you saw around the fort. And um, so with different communities, but if you start segregating communities, it could create a problem, but actually it's built for inclusion. So I think that is the way forward. And we're on a good track. I see it as positive, as long as there is jobs and there's, um, 
So that's why I find design a really important aspect. Because if you bring design into the old city with crafts, I think you attract young people, local craftsmen, and people from all over the world. So I really think that is the way forward. Well, you know, I think that uh, it's so fascinating to hear about how the family, your family, you yourself, have continued to stay involved in the lives of the people who live in Jodhpur and continually trying to improve their experiences. Um, is there anything else you want to add, Shabranjan? I would just like to say thank you, Nupali, for this exhibition. And um, no, and I, especially to you, I've, I've seen how you've depicted it here, different at the wrong from the other spaces. Which is taking out, one is making it more interactive, which I personally find very exciting. And as a, as a woman, I found this exhibition less daunting. <laughs> so that was really interesting. So thank, I thank you for that. That's a great thing. Thank you so much.